Okay, so this is Ecclesiastes for uh, Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number one, the introduction to this particular uh, series. And uh, we will be covering some of the, uh, of the book this morning. We'll be uh, looking at uh, chapter one in Ecclesiastes, hopefully uh, covering verses one to 18. And I might mention that um, uh, some of this uh, material uh, uh, is found in a great book by uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll, Living on the Ragged Edge. I want to mention that at the beginning. Uh, an older book, uh, but um, uh, very insightful as far as uh, the study of the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes really is a journal, a diary, the personal journal or diary of one man's journey through life. And in this journal, the writer observes several important things about his own life, because he's looking at his, at his own life. First, he, he notes his own loss of enthusiasm for life in general. Uh, he's very pessimistic, even depressed. You read, you know, you read Ecclesiastes and, oh man, it's, a, it's not a happy book. Uh, he also records his feelings and observations as he purposefully searches for joy and satisfaction in life apart from God. And you need to keep that in mind. He's looking for joy and satisfaction, contentment apart from a relationship with God. And then he sets forth his conclusions based on his lifetime of experiences. So it's a really excellent uh, book uh, about a person's um, experience in life. It's not theoretical, uh, it's experiential. Uh, this is the true story of a man who uh, he cut the cord, he did it all, who he went to the horizon of every experience that he desired or imagined and he left us notes about what he felt and what that was like. Imagine being able to do anything you wanted with your life and then experiencing it all and then you know, leaving notes behind for other people, other travelers in the journey of life. A great book because it teaches not from, as I say, simply a theoretical basis, but from a full experience of a, of a life lived. So a little bit about the book, uh, the author. Uh, the book doesn't actually name the author, but it refers to him as the preacher. And because of this, the book is called Ecclesiastes, and that word means one who calls the assembly. Uh, it was uh, called this by the authors of the Septuagint. Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the Hebrew. Uh, from the Hebrew to the Greek, they called it the Septuagint because there were 70 scholars working on it and they named this book uh, Ecclesiastes. The writer also identifies himself, not by name, but he identifies himself as a king who lived in Jerusalem, chapter one, verse one, the wisest person who had been ruler over Jerusalem, verses one, six, uh, the builder of great projects, chapter two, verse four to six, a man of much wealth, chapter two, verse eight, and a possessor of a large harem, chapter two, verse eight. So when you put all of these references together, uh, it can only be attributed to Solomon because only he among all the Jewish kings fits that description. Uh, the date, somewhere around 925 BC, 30 centuries ago, imagine 30 centuries ago, and it is still you know, relevant today. And that in itself is a good argument for the uniqueness of the Bible. You know, we give a lot of arguments why the Bible, we believe it's inspired. The fact that this piece of writing continues to relate to us perfectly today is one good argument for the uniqueness of the Bible. Uh, the theme of it is uh, in chapter one, verse two, vanity, emptiness. You know, we see vanity, if we say, oh, he's vain, or this is vanity expressing itself, we see that as pride. However, the term means breath, breath. And so the writer uses it as a metaphor uh, to mean purposefulness or uh, no, with no purpose or meaninglessness. Uh, everything is breath, everything is vanity. The point is that whatever man does apart from God, meaning without regard to God, 
in asking Him or thanking Him or serving Him, whatever we do in that context amounts to nothing in the end. It's like a breath, it's vanity. Now the reason he gives for this conclusion is that life without God is just a repetitious cycle of events and it, it, it doesn't give or possess any lasting value or satisfaction. In verse, uh, let's see, 1, 13 and 14, he says, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. So we see that many people since Solomon have come to the same conclusion and they have tried to inject with their own philosophies some sort of meaning to life that doesn't factor in the presence of God. For example, throughout history, I just you know, take a few things. Uh, materialism, the idea of materialism. Life is about gathering and using resources. Existentialism. Existentialism says, well, life is what you make of it. That's existentialism. Uh, positivism, life is whatever works best for you. And um, postmodernism, um, postmodernism says life is the sum total of your history. Cultural, you know, psychological, emotional history, that's what life is all about. All ideas trying to explain life without reference to to God. And, and they keep coming up with new ideas and new philosophies as time goes on. So think of Ecclesiastes as a journal or a diary written by a man who is consciously examining his own life's journey while he is experiencing it. So he's like on the outside looking in at himself and recording it. Okay? So he begins by introducing his journey in chapter 1 verses 1 to 11. The journey of life is seen as wearisome, an endless repetition of events that result in meaninglessness when, exam, uh, when examined. And so he gives the conclusion before he begins and then he explains how we got to that conclusion. <laughs> that's, that's how he you know, writes this. And so we, we go into the next section, which is uh, chapter 1 verse 12 to chapter 6 verse 9, uh, then he begins to describe the pursuit you know, and the exploring that he did throughout his life. You know, a lot of movies, they make a lot of movies like this. Have you ever seen a movie like this? The first scene in the movie is the, almost the end of the movie and, and you're watching something happen and then the movie and then the narrator, usually an, a narrator says, but, or it'll say two years before and then the, the scene will shift you know, to two years before and the movie will be about how you got to that part and then there'll be a resolution. Well this is written exactly in this way. He tells you the end, he starts at the end, you know, his conclusion in the very first verses and then he backs up and he begins telling the story of how he arrived at that conclusion. That's it's how this, uh, we think, oh wow, what a tricky thing you know, in movies. Oh, these guys are geniuses, but the, you know, 3,000 years ago this this, uh, this technique, this device was being used. So here Solomon describes his attempt at finding ultimate value and enduring happiness apart from a consistent walk with God. And he records areas that he explores and his findings, pursuing the journey. These are some of the things that he looks at. And what I'm doing is I'm giving you a recap and then we'll go back and we'll do it you know, a little at a time in the lessons to come. So in chapter 1, 12 to 18, he, he talks about the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom and he ends and he says the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom you know, ends in a lot of grief and increasing pain. He talks about the path of pleasure and possessions and he concludes that these are futile and they are unprofitable actually. He talks about to live wisely or foolishly and he says these are equally empty since both of them end in death. He writes about the work ethic and he examines the work ethic and he says that the work ethic is found to be full of grief and emptiness in the end because you can't keep what you earn. What's the point of working all your life to amass wealth and property? And he says because you can't, you can't take it with you. 
Uh, in chapter four, uh, verse one to six, nine, he says, even the accumulation of power and wealth through oppression are not satisfying and lead to frustration and dissatisfaction. And then he talks about the third part of the book, reflection and summary, chapter six, verse 10 to chapter 12, uh, 14. Solomon draws a general conclusion from his observations of a life lived under the sun. And this expression, a life lived under the sun, means a life lived here on earth. Under the sun, here on earth. And what he says about it is the lasting purpose and fulfillment can only be found in a trusting relationship with God. Nothing less will do. He talks about that in chapter six, verse 10, all the way to 11, verse six. A second conclusion, the young should remember and serve God while they are young, before age and death overtake them. Because yes, it's a long life, but that long life goes by very quickly. <laughs> goes by very quickly. You know, one, one minute you're young and you're starting out and, you're, and then just, it just seems like in a breath your, your kids are growing up and moving out. And then in another breath, they're calling you grandpa. And then thirdly, he says, the bottom line principle for a meaningful life is to fear God and keep His commands. Chapter 12, verse nine and 14. So there's a, a kind of a quick uh, overview of the book and how it's written, the theme of the book, what he's trying to get across. So let's now, let's double back to the beginning and give you a little bit of uh, background about Solomon himself. So Solomon's father, David, the second king of Israel, of united Israel. He, uh, he had fought many wars in order to secure Israel's borders and bring peace upon the land. He also left a great estate which made Solomon wealthy as he began his reign. So this wealth increased as tax money, normally used to provide for wars and armies, was left for Solomon to invest in other pursuits. So great riches plus relative peace provided him with the luxury of experimenting with various pursuits in order to find true happiness, happiness and satisfaction without regard to, uh, without regard to God. So chapters one, one to 11, establishes at the very outset his conclusions concerning the search. So he says in verse one to three, <clears throat> chapter one, he says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in, uh, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What advantage does man have in all of his work, which he does under the sun? So after identifying himself, Solomon goes on to state the basic premise of the whole book. That in life, when all is said and done, there will be nothing left that will give us a sense of accomplishment and gratification. So it starts off pretty low. <laughs> it's a downer right at the beginning. He says, when all his effort is over with life here on earth, there will be nothing left over that will satisfy man. That's his conclusion. And his point is that life on a purely human level, no matter how greatly it's lived, will be in the end worthless. Now in verses four to 11, the next verses, he presents various examples to support this premise. First of all, in verse, Four, he says, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. So that first cycle, the passing of the generations. People are born merely to die and nothing changes this. Why be if all that is going to happen to you is that you will cease to be? Second cycle, he talks about in verses five and six. He says, also the sun rises and the sun sets and hastening to its place, it rises there again, blowing toward the south, then turning towards the north. The wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses, the wind returns. So here he's talking about the cycle of nature. He says, all the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. So, the ceaseless rhythm of nature also demonstrates that activity in and of itself produces nothing of ultimate value. He says, you know, the sun rises, what? Only to set. The wind blows, but it doesn't go anywhere. 
The rivers fill the sea only to evaporate into rain and repeat the cycle. And this cycle of nature goes on and on to the point of weariness, he says. Nothing changes. Another cycle. He says, the eye is not satisfied with uh, seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. So this is the curiosity of man. When man's curiosity is aroused, he seeks answers, but the more he knows, the more questions he raises. As far as knowledge is concerned, there's no end and no satisfaction to it. One other cycle he talks about here. He says, um, that which has been seen uh, is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one may say, see this, it is new? Already it has existed for ages, which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things, and also of the later things which will occur. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. So the fourth cycle, the absence of something new. Solomon says he has observed that there is nothing really new, only that people forget what has gone by or they're not aware of it. Even the great discoveries are merely insights to what already is there. Imagine, you know, whoa, we've, we've discovered gravity. I hear, you, know, you see in the history, oh, they discovered gravity. Well, they didn't discover it, they didn't invent it. it was, gravity was always there. Somebody finally explained it. Somebody finally observed, oh, this is what happened. Isn't that what science is? You're observing, you're noting, you're looking at things that repeat themselves, you're trying to formulate certain laws. That's what Solomon is saying. We don't invent anything new, we just discover what's already there. And a lot of the new things are just new ways of doing old things. New inventions, as I say, better ways of doing things that we've always done. The car is great, was a great improvement over the horse and buggy, but basically from A to B, isn't it? It used to be from A to B in, in three days. Now it's from A to B in an hour. And now with the, I forget what they call it, what, what, you know, a travel there? <laughs> Help me, what's the travel name? Hyperloop. hyperloop, with the Hyperloop coming, right? We get into the Hyperloop and it's, uh, it's like at the bank, you know, when you put your check into the tube and it gets sucked up to the tele. Well, they were, they're working on that for human beings. It, that's new, but that's just another form of A to B. I don't know what will happen between A and B, but anyways, it's, you guys do that. So <clears throat> Solomon uses these four examples to drive home the point that life under the sun, when examined, is really meaningless. And this conclusion could uh, be very discouraging and many have reached it and stopped there without searching any further. You know, as I mentioned before, they have merely created philosophies of life to help them live with this conclusion. When I was talking about materialism and existentialism, positivism, so on, all the isms there, those are explanations that man has come up with to explain life without God. Solomon, however, pursued his investigation to a much more satisfying and workable and logical conclusion. He deduced the following. If there is nothing but nothing under the sun that has any meaning, then our only hope for meaning and satisfaction must be above the sun, outside of ourselves. He also said, if nothing satisfying or of less, a lasting value can be found in what is visible, then these things must be sought after in the realm of the invisible. So Solomon's conclusions are based on the idea that for every universal and corresponding innate need of man, there is an available and corresponding satisfaction. Because there is hunger, man feels hunger, there's food. Uh, because uh, human beings have a need for sexual expression, well, there's a sexual partner. 
He proposes that the search for meaning, for satisfaction, for lasting value, for life beyond death, is a universal human experience and can be satisfied but not by anything material, human, or earthly, only by something spiritual, godly, and heavenly. C.S. Lewis, the writer, explained this phenomena in his book, Surprised by Joy. And the book, Surprised by Joy, was written uh, as a, a way to um, describe his experience of, of being uh, converted to Christianity. And let's read a little section of that. He said, uh, it says here, some years ago, C.S. Lewis penned words that are directly relevant to the conclusion of Solomon. You know what I just said, for everything, for every need, there's a corresponding satisfaction. Note carefully what he said. Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger, well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire, well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. Interestingly enough, it was the desire to satisfy his longing for joy that eventually drove C.S. Lewis to Jesus Christ, and this is an excerpt from his book, Surprised by Joy. So in verses 12 to 18, Solomon explains how he has reached the conclusions that he has just stated. So let's read uh, verse 12 and 13a, he says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. So we know that Solomon had been blessed with great wisdom, you know, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 to 34, and not just a, a, a wisdom of, of common sense, but a capacity for study and memory, for discernment, application beyond what was known to man at that time. And so he writes that he decided to apply his great mind to the task of investigating by experience all of the different lifestyles or approaches to life that were common to men and then note the results of those experiences. So he didn't fall into this haphazardly. He did it on purpose. Okay? Verse 13 B, he says, it is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. So this would seem at first glance a pretty exciting life experiment to be involved in. But Solomon soon discovers and reports that, oh, this is an unhappy business. You know, this great idea I had, nah, not so good. I mean, he had what he thought was a life adventure and he discovered that it was not so. So in verses 14 to 18, in these verses, he describes what this exercise has taught him. So in verse 14, he says, first of all, all lifestyles are meaningless. So verse 14, he says, I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. So that all the lifestyles, their settings, and what they produce, all of these things, he says, are meaningless. Verse 15, he says, nothing can be changed. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. In other words, I've investigated all of this and realized nothing can be changed. There's so many things wrong with the world that they cannot be numbered even. I can't even tell you all the things that are wrong with this world, let alone try to fix it. Number three conclusion. Knowledge, he says, is useless. Even the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge by immersing oneself in each lifestyle turns out to be meaningless. He says, you know, chasing after wind, and we read the passage. I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge, and I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I realize that this also is striving after wind. And then the fourth conclusion. 
the desire for knowledge brings pain. He says, because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. And so the constant desire to increase in knowledge. Now remember, human knowledge, knowledge under the sun, not knowledge of God. He's talking about human knowledge. So the constant desire to increase in human knowledge only brings grief and pain. Why? Well, because you can't know what you need to know in order to produce peace and joy and security and meaningfulness of the whole by simply increasing your fund of knowledge and wisdom of the parts. So the constant increase only brings more difficult and complex questions which produce frustration, anxiety, and discouragement. Yeah, okay, let's go to the moon. So we've been to the moon. What now? Well, let's go to Mars. Okay, let's go to Mars. Next. Well, let's go to Pluto. How many trillions of dollars have we spent and exactly what have we discovered? I mean, exactly what? How has your life been impacted? Oh, I know all the spin-off benefits. Yeah, yeah, we have better uh, soda cans, you know, or we, yeah. better freeze-dried food. Philosophers spend their time sitting around, you know, discussing life under the sun, coming up with, have you, has anybody here you know, majored in philosophy? Has anybody here actually been to a, you know, an upper level philosophy class? Have you ever taken that in? Whew. It's pretty tiring. Because you have all of these philosophers explaining to one another uh, what life is all about here under the sun without reference to God. It's never satisfying. Never. And this is what Solomon is saying. He's not anti-knowledge. You know, he's, he's not anti-knowledge. In this book, he's anti trying to find the meaning of life simply by understanding what's here under the sun. That's what he's getting at. So the whole cannot be known without God. And to try to know it through knowledge alone, he says, this is futile. This is futile. So what if I study the sun and I get a, you know, a telescope that gets me close and I'm able to, to measure its exact you know, size and how much power it, it actually emits and all of the things. And, you know, and I know more about the sun and, than anyone has ever known about the sun. And, does that knowledge bring me joy? and satisfaction? It might earn me a living. I may go around to scholarly you know, meetings and talk about my great knowledge. The world's greatest scientist and, 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 and the one who knows the most about the sun, you know, okay, maybe you know, I'll earn a living doing that and write papers about the sun. But is that knowledge equal to a believer waking up and opening his blinds or her blinds and seeing the sunrise and say, my God, how great thou art. How wonderful your creation. How magnificent the things that you have done, O oh Lord. Please bless the things that I will do under the sun today as I offer to you my praise and my thanksgiving for the wonderful things that you have created. <laughs> you see what I'm, see what I'm saying? That guy who offered the prayer of thanksgiving and praise for what God has done probably doesn't know anything other than to stay out of the sun when it's too hot. <laughs> you know? Maybe that's all he knows about the sun. But the joy and satisfaction and contentment and peace that he, she experiences because he believes and understands that someone created the sun, someone much greater than the sun, that he is able to communicate with. And that person blesses him. So Ecclesiastes, you know, a valuable book for a lot of reasons. 
But one reason in particular is because it documents one man's search for meaning and value, as I say, under, under the sun. And his eventual understanding of the basic truth that some things cannot now and will never be found out here on earth. There are some questions that you will not be able to answer. It's interesting that uh, uh, our eldest son, uh, Paul, and I were just having a discussion yesterday and we were debating, not debating actually, just discussing something that there's no answer to. I mean, it took us you know, 40 minutes to actually, you know, <laughs> It took us 40 minutes to actually you know, develop the question, formulate the question. And here's the question, if I remember correctly. The question was, if God revealed, if, if, if while we are alive, I'll just take myself as an example, it'll just be easier for the pronouns here. If, if, if I am alive and one day God reveals to me, God appears to me and says, Michael, I'm going to show you what your glorified body looks like in heaven would I be able to recognize it? Would I be able to understand what I'm looking at or seeing? Right, was that the question? That's pretty much the question. And you know what answer we came up with? <laughs> Duh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. And we looked at references, well, how about Elijah and Moses, you know, when, 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 when they appeared you know, on the Mount of uh, Transfiguration, you know, and it says that uh, Jesus was talking to Elijah and Moses, you know, well, look, isn't that an argument for, we'll look exactly the way we look? And Paul said to me, yeah, but wait a minute, maybe that God did that on purpose so you know, we could at least recognize who those guys were. Okay. It's always fun to speculate what things will be like in heaven, but can we really know? Sure, 1 Corinthians 15 gives us some notion, some idea. It actually says that the thing that we will be in heaven doesn't look anything like what we are here on earth. You know, he says you plant a seed, you put the seed in the ground, you know, an apple tree seed, and an apple tree grows with apples. And the point is, if you looked at the seed in your hand and you looked at the finished apple tree, these two things don't look anything alike, and yet one comes from the other. And so he's saying, so will it be with your glorified bodies. Your physical body will be planted into the ground, you die, okay, and will be resurrected a glorified body. What was planted in the ground is not, does, it will not look at all like what will resurrect. And our question was, well, what will that look like? Well, I don't know. There is a limit to our knowledge about things here under the sun. And you know, if we extrapolate, there's also a limit to our knowledge about the things that will happen beyond the sun, beyond life. We'll never know the sum total of God, never, ever. We won't know that. We need to accept that idea. He will always be God, we will always be us. Maybe we'll be a better version of us, a different version of us, a glorified version of us, but we'll still be us and He'll still be the Lord. So, a lot of questions that have no answers in the hereafter, but Solomon is saying the search for more answers here on earth, if that's what you're giving yourself to, if that's what your life is about, you're going to have a very difficult life and a very painful life. And so um, uh, um, the main lesson of this kind of introductory stuff here, some things cannot now or will never be found here on earth, especially if we're pursuing them apart from faith in God. Okay, so we're going to stop here. The next section of his personal journey begins with a description of the four lifestyles that he immersed himself in and what he concluded with each of these lifestyles. Okay, that's our lesson, our introductory lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention.